I'm going to move ahead uh, a few years down the line here to the late 1990s when uh, another landmark moment for the Church of Scientology, the Lisa McPherson case. Can you uh, just generally describe your role in that, in handling that case for the church? Okay. My role in the Lisa McPherson case uh, began, I guess, a little bit earlier than the Lisa McPherson case. I had left Scientology in uh, late 93, November 93, right after we had got the exemption, about a year, about a month after we would gotten tax exemption, because it was something I sort of hung on and had been working on for nine, ten years and got, okay. Uh, shortly after that, I had left. David Miscavige persuaded me to come back. I went off to the ship in the Caribbean that we have to do training and get auditing services, which I really hadn't had a lot of in the 10, 12 years I'd been in Scientology. When I was done with all that, I had come back to the Flag Land Base in the summer of 95. And I was working for the RTC office at Flag under a woman named Angie who was in charge of that office. And basically she was David Miscavige's representative there. She was supposed to be handling all the technical uh, quality aspects of the church there. Um, um, I had expressed some uh, criticisms about the way she was handling some of the technical matters, the way she was coaching people on their communication drills and on how they handled their metering. And shortly after that, Miscavige showed up to the base, and I guess he heard I'd been uh, saying such things and told me, with no uncertain terms, that... Uh, I'm not to be telling anybody anything. I'm just supposed to be doing what she tells me to do. You know, I was the guy that blew the organization two years earlier. I'm supposed to follow her lead. He doesn't want me anywhere near him or on his lines. He doesn't want me bossing anybody around. And um, so it was like, you know, it was pretty much keep your hands off of, you know, any involvement in any decision making. So I was working on a whole program to, um, um, rehabilitate the class 12 auditors uh, at FLAG because there was a lot of complaints from parishioners about their services. And uh, in the course of this, I was walking through the Hubbard Guidance Center of the Fort Harrison when all of a sudden, where it's a, it's a completely quiet area. Everybody knows that has been a Scientology for any long. That whole uh, huge floor, it's all connected by a, a common hallway is a silent zone because people are having auditing sessions in each one of them. I was walking through that one day and a door kicked open and I heard this loud voice hollering in glee uh, in the hallway. And I thought that was really odd and I went and inquired about what was going on and I went up to one of the class 12s and I said, what's happening here? He says, oh, that's Lisa McPherson. She just uh, attested to clear. So I just, even though I was told I wasn't supposed to you know, say anything to Angie, I went down to talked to Angie, I said, you know, um, you, you've got a, somebody up in the uh, Hubbard Guidance Center who just attested to clear, who looks to me to be on the verge of psychosis. And she quickly reminded me that I'm not supposed to be having any say about anything and, you know, keep your mouth shut. She said, that's Lisa McPherson. She says, David Miscavige is CSing and programming her case, and I'm reporting on it weekly. Like, in other words, buzz off, to which I just went about my business and didn't think anything about it. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess about uh, six weeks later, or several weeks later, um, you know, I hear that there's this incident where um, Lisa McPherson is, um, had a uh, psychotic break and is coming to the Fort Harrison. And I inquired about that, like, how could you have somebody come to the Port Harrison? It was Angie or her direct junior, I think her name was Ricky, said, well, it's not a problem because COB, meaning David Miscavige, you know, has directed us on handling a Type 3 at the base just last May because somebody went nuts in the middle of uh, one of the events that he does down there. What's a Type 3? A type 3 is a person who's had a psychotic break. Okay. Okay. And uh, so a guy went to type three in the middle of an event, and he knew all about it, and we handled the whole thing right here on the base and reported the whole thing to him. So I said, okay. 
uh, and thought, you know, it's none of your business, I'm handling it. You know, she'd already told me that she's been reporting on the case weekly to him. So I thought nothing of it. I guess nine days later, something like that, Janji now comes to me and says, hey, you know, when you're doing a type 3 handling, what kind of sedative do you use if, uh, if a sedative is required? Like, is Valium or do you use something like that? I said, well, no, we usually, I mean, <laughs> I've seen type 3 handlings or participated in them for 20 years, and everybody always used chloral hydrate because it's the most mild, uh, least narcotic sedative, and it's very, very effective at getting somebody to sleep, and that's the whole purpose of it. And I had, you know, that was my, the only back and forth I had during that, that uh, matter of her there. But I thought it was really strange because we're nine days into it. I said, you're telling me nine days into it and you're looking for a, a sedative? Tom, this is what you need to understand. On a type 3 handling or a psychotic break handling, it's generally, you know, you've heard this thing about the person's put into isolation, right? Okay. That whole thing lasts a day, maybe two max. Do you understand me? Mm -hmm. In other words, if it goes beyond a day or two, there's something really weird going on. I've never seen it happen before. Well, subsequently, I learned they've got her in a, in a, in a room wh that, which is facing uh, Osceola Avenue, and there's city buses going by. There's all this noise going on. Uh, th there's a whole chain of wild events um, that were going on that just don't bear any resemblance to how you're supposed to do a Type 3 handling. But I didn't know all that at the moment. It was only to, when I s investigated it subsequently that I find that out. My point is, it's all hush-hush. This is my... This is my matter. This is something I'm reporting up lines, meaning to David Miscavige. Okay, so it's all her thing. So I'm supposed to go off and continue doing the things I'm doing around flag at that time, which is inspecting course rooms, helping people with their communication drills and their meter drills, uh, doing confessional auditing with um, uh, the t class 12s, who are the t highest level auditors down there, and all that sort of thing. One night, I back at the... Uh, RTC office, and she's doing up her daily report that goes up to Miscavige. And uh, usually I would come in and, and sort of uh, verbally debrief on what I did during the day, and she'd integrate that into her report. You know, we inspected this many course rooms, and we passed this many students, and we did this many confessionals, and these guys are coming around like this and that and that. Well, that evening, I couldn't do that because Angie was on the phone nonstop with other executives at FLAG talking about McPherson because um, she'd been taken to the hospital. And I guess, uh, so she wasn't even, you know, she wasn't even ex accessible to me because she was nonstop on the phone. When it, when it was all said and done, though, and they found out Lisa McPherson had died, it was she rushed out of the room and go ahead and meet with other executives on the base. So I didn't know what was going on. All I knew is that in my position, I was supposed to investigate the next day and find out what happened. Okay. And and from 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 then on, uh, you so you got pulled into the the McPherson case, uh, and what was what were your duties throughout the rest of that the case when it went to litigation and everything? Okay, I'll tell you what happened. We um, the next morning went to investigate what what went on, mm -hmm. and it was a it was like walking into a disaster area. There was uh, like fifteen people. 15 to 20 people who were, had been attendants. And it was like walking into a, a flood scene or something. I mean, they all looked devastated. They were they lacked sleep. Some of them had scratches and bruises from getting hit by Lisa. Um, all of them were extremely emotionally distraught because each one of them put it on their shoulders that they had done something wrong. Well, quite frankly, everybody did something wrong because the whole thing was done wrong. I mean... You don't have 15 different people rotating in and out of a room with somebody who's psychotic. The whole idea of this is, is you, of this isolation is, is you, you don't have any external stimuli re-stimulating the person and getting them to set off again. If you have utter stillness and utter quiet, they tend to calm down enough that they can then communicate and you can do some auditing and then you can help bring them up and pull them out of the thing. Tom, I've seen this work on a number of people over the years, all the way from my beginning days in Scientology. It's really quite simple. They have 15 people rotating in and out. She's getting a different new stranger in the room every other day. 
They've got people in there bawling their eyes out. You're not supposed to say a word. In fact, you're not even supposed to be in the room. Okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't describe to you how 180 degrees diametrically opposed the handling of her was to what the scripture says is the way you're supposed to handle something like that. In fact, you had a phrase for how it was handled, um, a perfect storm. Or I thought it was a perfect storm of, of incompetence and irresponsibility. And I, and, I, and I say the irresponsibility and incompetence because the writings say that you've got to have a complete full medical examination. You've got to rule out that this person isn't in some kind of hidden pain, and that's, not, that's the source of all this, okay? You're not going to pull a person out of a wild area of spiritual and mental distraught if they're in, in excruciating pain. So a complete, thorough medical examination is required, okay? Never had it. They had a woman in there who was on staff, who was a doctor, who you later uncovered didn't even have a license, had lost her license for abusing medical prescription drugs. Uh, who, who the CS, who's the, really the person directing the whole thing, he's assuming that she's done such, but there's no evidence she's ever done, done such. And it's, but it's, a, it's a dueling match between Elaine Karnazinski, the CS, and Janice Johnson, the doctor. Janice Johnson thinks, boy, I'm under the direct supervision of a class 12, the top CS at the Mecca of Technical Perfection, and he ain't telling me to do anything, so I must be doing everything right. You understand? And on the other hand, you got Elaine thinking, well, nothing serious can actually happen here because I've got a bona fide doctor who's going in to see her every single day. So each of them are pointing the finger in the, in, in the other direction. Of all the people in the entire place, I mean, we had maids who were from Central America who couldn't even speak English, who spent an uh, afternoon in there. 201, each one of them felt was fully responsible for the result of that. The only ones that didn't were Elaine and Janice. Now, Jane, El Elaine ultimately did, but I don't know if Janice ever did. But you understand what I mean by irresponsibility. Mm -hmm. They're looking at, they're pointing the fingers at one another, and they're the only, one, only two who were doing that. Everybody else who had no responsibility, really, because they're really at the, at, the, at the beck and call of Janice and Elaine, they feel fully responsible. So that's the state of affairs. Um, I know early on, that same day while I was doing all that, uh, Angie said she had to go because she had to go handle the folder, which I subsequently learned was vetted of any evidences of Miscavige's hand in the deal. But this is what happened. So my whole mandate is to handle the internal aspect of it, just to get to the truth. And a day into that, uh, the Clearwater police show up and say they want to speak to Elaine and uh, Janice. Well, I guess somebody identified Elaine and Janice. Uh, I don't know. I don't know how that worked. Or they just voluntarily were the ones that said they were responsible. They had to go to the Clearwater Bank building and see the police. Had not on my lines at all because I'm only handling this, you know, orders that are issued as per David Miscavige's orders. Well, what happens is Janice and Elaine go in and tell the police a complete and utter lie. They s said there was no religious services whatsoever. This was all a situation of a woman coming for rec uh, rest and relaxation at the Fort Harrison. So now that's on record with the police, okay? Later that day or that evening, I get a call that I gotta go, I gotta go out to Clearwater Beach to get, a, uh, get on a pay phone to get a confidential call from David Miscavige. I get the call, and he says to me, why aren't you all over this thing? Why, are, why is Tom DeVock handling the police, and why is Tom DeVock arranging interviews? Where are you in all this? Why are you, you know, and I'm not going to, by the nature of the whole relationship, you don't say, well, sir, you know, three months ago you told me to shut my mouth, <laughs> and when somebody says jump, you know, I say how high. You don't do that. You listen, and you take it, and, you know, whatever. But he's now saying, get on it. So that's the, that's the hand I'm dealt. I got two false sworn statements to law enforcement agents. I've got uh, the worst possible perfect storm of incompetence and irresponsibility in terms of what actually went down, okay? Um, and that's how it begins.